What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School and MorganAPTeaching.com. I've got here another AP review video for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know on how to help you pass the AP test. So feel free to check out my website, and if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, so we'll do AP US history. We're going to start with period one, which is the years uh, 1491 to 1607. It's only like five ish percent of the test, but a lot of the stuff in this period you have to know going forward. It sets up a lot of things like what Native American tribes are, or wh which ones there are, uh, systems like exploration, mercantilism, colonial, and things like that. So we'll talk about those, and then we'll go on to period two. So uh, period one, um, they, a lot of things they cover are Native Americans before Columbus discovered the Americas, so before you know the Columbian Exchange and disease and all that stuff killed 90% of them. Um, so we'll talk about sort of the uh, major developments in trade networks and some of the regions and how those natives sort of survived. So one thing they want to talk about is uh, maize or, or corn, as you know we know it, that was developed in uh, Mexico region, southern Mexico, and uh, that's going to be the staple crop for a lot of the uh, Native American civilizations, uh, especially pre-Columbian. Of course, once the Europeans do show up, they uh, love the corn, uh, whole idea, they, they cultivate it, take it back, and they use it as meal for a lot of their livestock and things like that. So maize or maize uh, is going to be developed roughly 10,000 years ago is when they actually domesticated. Um, out of, like I said, the Maya people over here in Olmec, um, those uh, tribal regions are going to be the ones that sort of develop it, and then it's going to spread also uh, via trade and uh, migration to the Andes regions, or land like the uh, uh, Incan people and the uh, Modoc, no, not Modoc, who were the people before the Incans? I forgot the people before the Incans, but the Incans. Uh, so that's 6,000 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. No, Aztecs are, uh, they're different. They're, they're a different tribe that comes down from uh, the Texas region and they form like a, an alliance of three city-states and conquer a bunch. That's much later. Um, it starts with an M. I just can't remember what... Moki. Moki. M-O-C-H-E. That's who they are. Anyways. Uh, so that, 6,000 years ago, goes down to like the South America Andes region. And then the uh, Olmec and Maya people, of course, also migrate and trade and bring maize up into... Uh, the southwest-ish region of the United States. And that was about, I think it was about 2400 BCE. You actually get uh, corn in what is now like the southwest, southwest United States. Uh, and that's going to spread out too, because obviously it works. It's uh, calorie dense. It's decently easy to grow. People can live off of it. And they uh, get a surplus, which they can trade around. And they do. And that sort of starts developing a, uh, an extensive trade network running between what is now like Mexico and the southern part of what is now the U.S. So they do actually cultivate and trade it. All right. Uh, for the AP test, they also want you to know about how Native Americans uh, survive in the various regions. Because uh, it's not all the same. Obviously, the topography of the United States is, I mean, you've got mountain regions, coastal regions, plain regions arid regions, more deserty, and they have different ways of lifestyles and surviving there. So one of the areas I want you to know about is what's called like the Great Basin, which is basically um, a, a, an area between sort of and including partly like the Rocky Mountains and between like the Sierra Nevada range. So it's this-ish region here, uh, and it's what you call arid. There's not a lot of rainfall. Uh, you do get some in the winter, you get like flooding and things, but there's not a whole lot of water there. So the thing I want you to know about the Great Basin uh, American Indians is how they survived in this arid uh, environment. During the winter early spring, there was some water flow from the mountains and some rain, so they could actually just sort of settle by those river basins uh, for food. So winter equals river basins. Uh, and they, they were able to get along there pretty well. But in the summer, when those kind of dried up, they had to move around a lot because they very quickly used up all of the uh, foraging uh, or would kill off the animals, so they had to like move constantly uh, throughout the summer. So they were very nomadic, nomadic in summer. 
And some of those pueblos and things that you guys would see, um, maybe you've seen on National Geographic or whatever, uh, those were settlements that they would reside in more during those winter months by, you know, close to the river basins because they could actually permanently set up there until the water started to dry up and the resources, and then they had to move around. All right. Um, pretty big region, but a very common way of living is basically the east, central and eastern part of the United States. So, like, the Mississippi River uh, runs right down the middle here with other rivers feeding to it. So everyone in this river valley, as well as the Great Lakes regions and the east coast of the United States, uh, they all lived a similar lifestyle. Hunting and gathering, they had some agriculture as well, um, and they, they traded with each other. And we know this because a city which is around-ish the area of like Illinois or so nowadays, um, there is a city, or what was a city they think, called Cahokia. And that city has artifacts and um, archaeological evidence from the Rockies regions and the Great Lake regions and the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast. So we do know there is definitely some sort of Mississippi River Valley trade network where all of these different tribes at one point had people going between and trading uh, goods. Because again, they're all found in these large mounds in uh, what was Cahokia. So I guess you could say central slash eastern uh, natives. They lived as hunter-gatherers, uh, some agriculture, and they also had um, a sort of like Mississippi River Valley trade network. And we know that, again, because of all the archaeological evidence we found in uh, Cahokia, which is kind of a central location there. All right, uh, the Native Americans living on the coasts of the uh, Pacific, specifically in the uh, northwest here, like was what now Oregon and Washington, uh, there's a ton of rainfall. It's actually technically a rainforest. It's not like what you think of in the Amazon, how it's like, you know, these really hot, humid jungles, but it gets so much rain, it literally never, the, the grass and foliage never dies. It's, it's always green. I think they call it Washington the Evergreen State, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so they survived off of the sea. There was a lot of um, thriving sea life, clams, otters, things like that. Uh, and then they could forage, hunt, and uh, cultivate the uh, rainforest because there was just plenty of water. So they were a pretty permanent settlement, uh, and they lived along the coasts. So Pacific coasts, then of course live off the coasts and the rainforest pretty easily. And those are the three main regions. Hey, welcome. These are the three main regions. Um, that they want us to know about for the actual AP test. All right. Any questions about that? So the Pacific Coast people just lived up the rainforest? Mm -hmm. Especially up here in the Northwest because there's the steady supply of uh, rain and water. So they didn't really have to move around a whole lot or hunt, gather, or be nomadic. They could pretty much just settle in by the coast and there was enough to live off of there. All right. Uh, one thing they also want us to know too is sort of how. Native American culture, um, by the way, the, the, the names Indian, American Indian, Amerindian, Native American, all the same thing. It's just the same name for uh, the essentially indigenous people uh, that crossed over 20,000 years ago or so across the land bridge and settled North and South America. Uh, of course, they were mislabeled by Columbus. He thought he landed in India. That's why he called them Indians. So it's kind of a misnomer, but it's, it's an acceptable name uh, to most people. So um, in this especially northeast region. There's a couple tribes here, like for example the Mohawk tribe. You probably heard this uh, from your other AP uh, US teachers. Uh, there was sort of a, a, not exclusively matriarchal structure, but some of the tribes did have a matriarchal structure in that women participated in the decision-making processes. Um, so while you had this definitely, the things that were like physically labor-oriented were definitely uh, distributed to men, like combats, hunting, fishing, building, those sorts of things. Uh, but women also took part in the decision ma making. So an example is the Mohawk tribe. Uh, women were involved, of course, in child rearing, but also they were the ones that tended to the agriculture. Um, this is also kind of known, by the way, more so in the South here. It's kind of an AP world topic, but it's more so known as gender parallelism in that there wasn't like a, a hierarchy of males or, or females or above each other, but it's the idea that both have different roles, but they're equally important. Like, obviously, someone needs to cultivate the land and raise kids, right? And that's not necessarily more important than 
combat or exploration or trade or hunting. Right? Those are both complementary tasks that keep the tribe going. Um, so what do we put for that? So women responsible for agriculture and child rearing. And then of course men, uh, hunting, fishing, any sort of exploration, and then uh, also as soldiers. All right, and that's kind of the way we set up. I don't want to say that was how it was everywhere, because there's definitely a lot of patriarchal Native American societies, but they do want you to note that there were some up here, especially in the Northeast, that had a more gender parallel, if not matriarchal, uh, structure to them, at least for the time being. You guys good on that? All right, so now let's talk about Europeans actually making their way over there. So, exploration itself. So you all know about Columbus in 1492 and all that good stuff. Hey, hey. Um, we'll briefly go over, over all this really in-depth in AP world, but I will go over it generally so you have an idea of just what you might have to know for the A push test. But again, this isn't as intense. Uh, I would just it's more of like a background knowledge that, that, that I guess they want you to know. So Europeans. Um, they're going to be exploring the Americas. They discover by accident. Do uh, you guys remember what they were looking for? why they were sailing west in the first place, the Europeans, there was a reason. What? Weren't they looking like, I'm trying to, I think Portugal, like weren't they looking Okay, like it was Portugal and Spain, yeah, definitely. So Portugal doesn't try to go west, they try to go around Africa. But like, what are they trying to go around Africa for? And Spain, of course, is the one going west. Wasn't it really like more trade? More trade with who? Asia. Yeah. Asia, yeah, so specifically India and China. Now, the Europeans could trade with them before in the post-classical era, when we had the uh, Mongol Silk Roads going, when they stabilized that, um, and there was some trade going through the Middle East. But after the Mongolian Empire falls, and the Silk Road sort of dissipates, and uh, the Caliphates are completely blocking off Europe because there's this very intense Christian-Muslim uh, rivalry going on, Europeans can't trade with the East. They've got the caliphates blocking the Middle East, and there's no silk roads they can take through Central Asia anymore. So they have to find their own route. Okay, So that's what they start doing. The Portuguese start trying to map and sail around North Africa, because the Europeans, and really anybody that isn't in West Africa, doesn't know what it's like past this point in West Africa. So the Portuguese start sailing and mapping and going around. They eventually do connect with uh, India. We don't care about that, though, for a push. Yeah, no, we're gonna. We don't care about Europeans connecting with Asia. We care about the Europeans that ended up in the Americas, obviously, because it's because it's a push. But just so you know why they're doing it, it makes it easier to remember what it is if you actually have the context of why. Because I can tell you, Vasco da Gama discovered India. Like, well, like who cares? If you know why they're doing it and you have a story behind it, it's easy to remember. So that's the Portuguese. Uh, but the Spanish decide to um, try sailing around the world. Now, obviously, they don't know these continents are in the way, but they're like, okay, we should be able to, if the moon and the sun, all the planets are round and spheres, so should then the Earth be a sphere. It's just so big we can't tell that it's, you know, a sphere. So they think all we have to do is sail west, and we'll end up in China and or India. So that was their idea. So uh, Italian sailors like Christopher Columbus are hired uh, mostly by patrons, right, people paying for it, royals like Ferdinand Isabella in Spain, or other wealthy investors, and they send him off, and sure enough, he winds up here, he can't sail directly across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, he winds up here in the Caribbean, uh, the people are a bit darker, uh, so he immediately thinks that he's landed in India, uh, which is why he mislabeled them Indians, of course. So, he discovers that, and, um, by the way, what were these winds that brought him on over here to the Caribbean? Because you can't just sail across the Atlantic. You, you kind of get caught in this, the current. You guys remember the winds that brought them over from like West Africa over in the Americas? Oh, no, monsoons in the, in the Indian Ocean. These are the trade winds. Yeah, yeah and when they come back, they kind of have to like be taken up here in the northern Atlantic and dumped off in northern Europe. Those are the westerlies. So they discover these, these sort of wind patterns that they're able to sort of take somewhat consistently. All right, uh, so he winds up over there, discovers Native Americans, and we have what is called, oh, actually, first, I think I have to tell you about the uh, technologies they used to do this. So while the Vikings had done this, you know, 500 years ago with their longboats, kind of taking this uh, Ireland to Iceland to Greenland to uh, 
northern Canada route. They didn't tell anybody about it. But the Europeans are able to get there because they have some new navigational technology that they've either taken uh, or found out about from or refined from the Chinese and the Arabs. Um, do you guys remember which instrument it was that let them know how far north and south they were? The Not the compass. Know, um, That's the direction. The astrolabe. astrolabe, right. Astrolabe has like a fixed map of the stars. So depending on where the stars are in relation to you and which ones you can see, you kind of know how far north or south you are. So things like the astrolabe, because you obviously need to know how north and south you are, uh, or how far north and south you are, um, to be accurate. You also have the compass, which of course is a Chinese invention, that tells you what magnetic north is. So if you can tell which way north is, you can make sure you go in a straight line. Otherwise, the current's just going to take you somewhere else, or you're going to walk in circles. And Humans aren't very good at walking in straight lines. Like, it's actually kind of funny. Your, your left foot and your right foot are actually walking slightly different distances. So even if you walk in a straight line, because one side doesn't walk as far, you'll actually do a really, really large circle, even if you think you're starting straight. Anyways, so you got the compass. That makes sure they can go the right direction. But these aren't any good if I can't give myself accurate sort of uh, maps to follow. Uh, and the reason why, or the technique they developed to do this well is a technique called Portland Maps, which you may remember from last year in World. Those they make by basically going in a straight line with a compass, and they track how long it takes to get to certain distances. And since they're essentially traveling at roughly the same speed the whole time in a boat, in a sailboat, um, they're able to map distances, and that actually allows them to sort of find the shape of coasts. And that's what a Portland map is. So they like start from a spe specific, well, can't even say specific. They start from a specific port, and they go off in different directions, uh, tracking how long it takes, and that actually makes a pretty damn accurate map for them. All right. They also have these very small but high in utility ships that can uh, move quickly in small areas, but also carry a lot of cargo and people. You guys remember what those are called? Mm -hmm. Charge the sea. Ends with an Arabelle. Caravelle, yeah. <laughs> Caravelles, and those caravels are able to make much more um, sharp turns because of the stern post rudder. And that should be more than enough info on the technology that allows them to explore. So that's how Europeans actually get out over there. Funding. I told you about one way. This is expensive to have a ship built and pay for the supplies and get a crew and give them a salary for risking their lives going out and coming back several months later, if not years later. So one group that funded them is people that already had money, uh, states themselves, so the king and queen, uh, nobles, princes, things like that. That's known as royal patronage. You also have companies like charter companies that get a charter, basically permission, from the crown. This is much more popular, by the way, in England and the Netherlands. They get a charter or permission from the crown to like sort of function as a mini government uh, and do the majority of the settling. Because most of these governments don't have money to just shell out to start a colony. So they depend on like entrepreneurs and companies to do it. So they give them a charter to essentially function as a government for a fixed amount of time, and that's going to allow them to settle a lot of these colonies. Uh, now, since the government's not funding it, people have to fund these. So again, charter companies. And again, they function as many governments until the government is established and the government takes over. Um, how do they fund these? It's multiple people. You guys remember how they do that? Is it like joint stock? Joint stock, yeah. So what's joint stock? So it's when like a bunch of people, they work together and then they basically like divide parts of um, like their exploration. And so, like, I don't know, they just divide it equally, so then... The cost, what they... Yeah. Th these people are usually not going on the voyage. They're mm -hmm. usually funding the voyage. So, yes, you have it correct, it's just they're not actually doing the work. Like, they're the ones saying, okay, I've got X amount of thousands or millions of dollars, so I'm going to contribute a percent to your voyage, and then when you come back, if you come back, how am I paid? You get double. By your percentage. Like yeah, I get the same percent profit back. So, for example... They, like on Crash Course, they have a good analogy of this. Like, so if this is a, a boat and it costs a million dollars, it's a terrible boat. If it costs a million dollars to fund this voyage for the boat and the supplies and the crew and all that stuff, um, I could donate uh, $100,000 to this company 
and that's 10 percent, right? Boat goes back or it goes out, it doesn't get destroyed or pirated. It ends up coming back with gold or silver or tobacco or whatever the really, really expensive stuff is. And it makes a profit of like $10 million. Like the returns like 10 to 20 times. I think they're actually higher than that. But So if I donated $100,000 out of a million, that's 10%. Uh, I would end up out of this $10 million profit, I would get a million, right? Which is a 10 times return. So it's wonderful to do this. Uh, what they would do though, is instead of like, putting it all into one boat, because the odds of that boat not coming back are pretty high. It could get shipwrecked or killed by natives or pirated or whatever. Uh, so what they would do is instead of like putting all their million into one ship, they would put 100,000 into 10 ships. So it's like, okay, half those ships don't come back. But I don't care because half of them do. And I get 10 to 20 times returns on those, so I make a whole bunch of money. Right, so that's what they would do. They would fund those. And that's, of course, through charter companies. And the technique they use would be called uh, joint stock. That, whole, that sort of starts this whole commercialization process, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So let's keep talking, though, about um, what they're actually, why they're actually doing this. So first of all, which we're already describing here, is people are motivated to explore uh, to get rich, right? There's three Gs uh, to exploration as far as motivation. There's God, gold, and glory. Uh, this is the gold uh, portion of it. So they're um, motivated by profits. Because again, a lot of these colonies we're going to talk about, in the Americas, they're started by companies, like Massachusetts Bay Colony was technically a charter. Um, what else is a charter? I believe Georgia, the colony was a charter. Virginia was a company. Like all these are started by charters. It's not like the British are sending over their soldiers to do this. People are privately funding it, and they're hoping to make money off of it. And that's how these colonies get going. Um, so motivations, of course, are going to be a profit or gold in the three Gs. And 3G's God, gold, and glory. And the returns are quite high because there's several things in the New World that are either in abundance, that aren't in abundance in the Old World, like gold and silver in certain regions, not, not so much on the East Coast. But, but you also have things like uh, tobacco, that's a big one. Other crops like corn and potatoes. You can grow rice and sugar and coffee, which are actually Old World goods, but they grow super well over here. And there's no African kingdoms or Asian kingdoms to compete with here, uh, so the Europeans can sort of start these plantations and make a lot of money on it. So one of the big motivating motivations is profiting, and they're able to profit from things like gold, silver, tobacco, um, even stuff they bring over from the old world like rice. Um, what other things I mentioned? Uh, chocolate or cacao. Um, what else? Wheat. I'm missing a big one. Sugar, that was the other big one, sugar. I was like, I know there's another big one, sugar. So those are all things that they're able to either bring back or grow themselves and bring back. It's highly, highly, highly profitable. Is it potatoes that people consume? Yeah, it is, but these are more so what you call cash crops. Okay. Now, I know wheat and rice, you technically can live off of, but mostly cash crops are things that you can't sustain yourself on. You just pay for them because they're a really fun luxury good, at least back then. So they would get addicted to nicotine from tobacco, or they liked putting sugar or chocolate on their foods to make them taste better. Things you don't need, but they pay a lot to use because they're because they're awesome. So um, that's the gold. The glory is a lot of these guys want to make names for themselves because if you guys notice, all the colonies and cities in the Americas they're named after people or kings or kingdoms like. Uh, New England, for example, Georgia, named after St. George, or not St. George, uh, King George. Um, Carolina was named after King Charles. So they, they really want to put their mark on the world by starting a colony, naming after themselves, uh, but also just growing their empires uh, from Spain or Portugal or France or England or Netherlands or even Sweden, by the way. They actually start some colonies too. Uh, they're all trying to expand their kingdoms, their noteworthiness. Um, and their, uh, well, basically their reputations. So state and individual. So it could be for the, the state of England, the kingdom of England, or it could be just the individual like uh, uh, the Duke of York, right? New York, it's named after uh, the Duke of York. All right, what else is there? Oh, God, the God portion. The God portion is most of the American settlers, now Protestants do follow in, uh, through England and the Netherlands, but they're not as aggressive, and, and I literally mean aggressive, by the way, on the converting. The most aggressive conversions come from uh, Spain and Portugal, the Catholic converts. 
So one of the major reasons why they wanted to explore is they wanted to civilize and provide Christianity for the um, quote unquote savages as, as they saw them in the new world. So we have a lot of conversion attempts. So, and they're mostly Catholic too, by the way. I'm not saying Protestants didn't, or Protestants weren't aggressive, but by and large, the largest campaign, the most aggressive campaign was by the Spanish and Portuguese Catholics. All right, so uh, Catholic, into lesser extent Protestant, conversion of natives, and um, some of the monks that are going to be doing this are Franciscan monks, Dominican monks. These are all Catholic, by the way. Um, the Jesuits. These are all organizations that are going to try to aggressively convert the Native Americans. Um, there was some debate on their tactics because they were fairly brutal. Like It wasn't like, a, oh, here's the Bible. Do you want to come follow us? It was like, no, here's your choice. Do this or be imprisoned or enslaved or die and then they were enslaved anyway, usually. So, um, their conversion tactics weren't exactly friendly, nor were anyone's really back then, by the way, but um, they were going to uh, do this, but there were some individuals that were like, whoa, 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 if we're Christian, Catholic or Protestant, we probably shouldn't be forcing conversion, right? That doesn't sound very Christian. That's what some of the monks would end up saying. One example, I think we talked about this in AP Euro a year ago, uh, was Bartolome de las Casas, He was a monk in the early 1500s who very much was opposed to the treatment of the uh, Native Americans, how they were being used for labor, how they were being forced to convert, essentially, how, how if their purpose was to civilize them, they shouldn't just treat them as savages after they've been you know, educated or converted then. Uh, and he wrote a bunch of very, I guess you would say, poignant letters to the king and queen of Spain. Um, and he was pretty far away, so he was kind of out of their reach for punishment. But he was pretty critical of the Spanish treatment of those Native Americans. Now, and there's other examples, but he's probably the most famous one. And for the AP test, for all these topics, as long as you've got one or two solid examples to point to, uh, you're, you're pretty much good. As long as you know the general development and you have like one example to point to, you'll be solid. So would you be able to talk about like, the Inquisition for like the Spanish? Like, to convert no, that's more of a European thing. That was more so used in the religious wars. Um, I'm not specifically sure about the Inquisition's presence, if at all, in the New World. Uh, I'm sure it was. I don't know a lot about it. It's not famous enough to be common in AP U.S. history or U.S. history talk. So I would stay away from that. Just take a general approach of Spaniards trying to convert them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have some people opposing that. Um, so that is the three G's, we covered them all, the glory of the God and the gold. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this Colombian exchange system, which is just another word for how when we brought over goods from one side to the other. Colombian exchange, which again is just kind of a term for bringing over a lot of things that existed in Africa, Asia, and Europe uh, that didn't exist in the New World, in North and South America, and vice versa. There's a lot of things over here that didn't exist in the Old World, and they're going to be exchanged. Um, and that's known as the Columbian Exchange. So, some examples, and they want you to know this for the, the AP test too. Columbian Exchange is essentially just the uh, transfer of goods between the Old World, which again is Afro-Eurasia, and the New World, which is North and South America. So, some things that were exclusively, this is not all of them obviously, but it's just the main ones. Some things that were exclusively in the New World were things like corn, potatoes, uh, tomatoes, most forms of peppers, not all of them though. Um, what else? Llamas, not that they brought over a lot of those. Uh, cacao. Yeah, and so venereal diseases like syphilis, that was that was a fun one to bring back. Uh, no, measles wasn't brought from the New World, that was brought to the New World. So these are things going that were existed here before Columbus made you know contact. And then after the Spaniards and other Europeans started trading and going between, they were brought back to the Old World. So these are things that were exclusively in the New World that were brought over uh, to the Old World. And not that gold and silver is exclusive, because it wasn't, but there was a lot of untapped silver in places like Peru, Nevada, Mexico, copper as well, and gold that the Europeans got a hold of too. But those aren't exclusive. Exclusive Old World goods that they brought over. Uh, pretty much all livestock. Pigs, horse, not, not that horses are livestock, but pigs, cattle, uh, also horses, other domesticated animals. None of those, for the most part, existed in the Americas. 
which made it pretty impressive, by the way, that they built so many things over here, like pyramids and roads, because they didn't really have like beasts of burden and ox to carry these things like they did in the old world. So livestock and horses, um, a lot of technology. I won't list the technology, but you know, gunpowder, guns, cannons. Uh, you have things like uh, sugar. They bring that over. Coffee is brought over, and those are things that grow extremely well in the uh, the rainforest equatorial regions of North America, sorry, South America, and the Caribbean and Southern United States. Those all grow very well there. Uh, so the Europeans make a lot of money off that. Oh, I forgot the big one for the New World, by the way. Going back a second. Tobacco. I knew I was forgetting the big one. Tobacco, which is smoked by the uh, American Indians, and then they showed the settlers, or the Europeans how to do it, that, that hooked people pretty quick on tobacco and like, you know, pipes and later chewing tobacco and things like that. Anyways, back to the old world goods. Livestock, horses, sugar, uh, coffee, rice, uh, okra from Africa. You also had wheat. All these goods are going to be exchanged for the first time over. And diseases. This is what's going to unintentionally kill 90% of Native Americans. Uh, because basically diseases hopped over from livestock over thousands of years, killed a bunch of Europeans, Asians, and Africans. But the ones that survived uh, were resistant enough to survive the infection. So after a few thousand years, you've got populations in the uh, African, uh, Asian, and European kingdoms that they still get sick and some still die, but much less die from these diseases like measles, smallpox, the common cold, things like that. However, when you bring them all over at once to uh, North and South America and they've never been exposed to these things, it wipes out like 90% of the people. Uh, so disease was a big one, an unintentional uh, sort of, I guess, a consequence, negative consequence of uh, things like smallpox, measles, tuberculosis, that stuff just wiped out uh, the Native Americans. So they would show up, exchange with them, maybe not even visibly sick because they're immune to the actual viruses that they're carrying. They would you know, exchange, talk with, meet with these natives, go away for a few days or weeks, come back, and all of a sudden, you know, most people are dead or dying. And they're like, whoa, what happened? That's what happened. Uh, they exchanged a lot of disease without knowing it. All right, that's the Columbian Exchange. So obviously the impact here is old world population just dives. 90% of people die, so that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, the old world, though, you actually have a population increase because these foods are calorie dense. That helps people survive. Uh, you also have Europeans especially get super rich off of this stuff because uh, they're able to bring it over. Uh, Europeans, Africans, and Asians are paying a lot for it. Um, you have them, of course, um, uh, making and selling things uh, that were brought over from the old world uh, in much higher quantities and brought back and sold. So the Europeans uh, make a ton of money off of selling amongst themselves, as well as selling to the African and Asian kingdoms that were already there. Uh, so that is the Columbia Exchange. Essentially, enriches Europeans and sort of decimates the population of Native Americans unintentionally. You guys got the Columbia Exchange? Sweet. Let's move on to a couple more topics left for period one we're done ski. All right, so um, now let's talk about some things we still have to talk about for period one are the encomienda system and then colonialism, which we pretty much described already, and then briefly mercantilism. And that should be enough to cover period one adequately. So, um, all right, what did I just say? Oh, come into system. This was a system set up by the Spanish uh, to, of course, encourage Spanish to go over to conquer and settle the land, as well as to sort of control the native population. So what they would do was, as Spain came over, because Spain's going to conquer most of the actual uh, New World here. They're going to conquer most of South America and a huge chunk of the southern portion of uh, North America. So they've got a, a massive chunk there. And they're going to reward this land to people to conquer it. And that's going to be called the encomienda system. So encomienda is like a land grant, kind of, or a kingdom, sort of. And the encomiendera is the guy that rules over it. And on those encomienda, which we talked about last year, they have individual plantations, ranches, and mines. Those are called haciendas. Uh, regardless, this system is going to utilize the labor of natives. I'm actually going to borrow the Incan Mita system, which is like a system for organizing uh, labor tasks and pay. Uh, they're going to use Native Americans for a lot of the labor, but uh, again, a lot of them are going to die off of the disease. So they're not going to have enough 
it's going to be a big problem in the Americas for a long time is labor shortages. There's like lots of land, lots of stuff to mine and collect, and, but there's just not enough people to do it. So one source of labor that they're going to get, uh, besides that Americans until they you know, start dying off, are other Europeans and then West African slaves. So we'll do the other Europeans first. So very expensive to uh, make a trip over to the Americas. So what's a really common tactic to use, not so much in Spain, but more so uh, up here in North America, when England and France and uh, the Dutch and Swedish sh show up. It's called indentured servitude. So if I can't afford a trip over to the Americas to you know, settle my own land or start a new family or mine for gold or whatever the hell it is I want to do, um, I can sort of contract myself for labor. So a company basically pays for my ticket and then I do labor for that person or country for like two, three, four, five, six, seven years, whatever the contract stipulates. Right, so that's an indentured servant is. You're sort of paying for your trip with your labor for X amount of years. So you're actually free labor technically, um, but I guess they, they did pay for your trip, but that's indentured servants. There's gonna be a problem with that though, because if everybody over there is white for the most part, and they were, you know, especially in the uh, uh, American colonies, uh, or sorry, North American colonies, like with the British, the Swedish, and the Dutch, it's super easy to just run away and go grab some free land, you know, in another town or another area over the hill or whatever, and then all of a sudden I make way more money anyway. So they did that a lot. And it was really hard to keep track of who was who, right? Because everyone looked somewhat similar the same. So they actually found, um, unfortunately, uh, a much better way to keep track of free labor, and that was to use African slaves who were purchased, well, they went through a couple different exchanges. Most African slaves were collected by fellow West African kingdoms. So they'd have tribal wars, or they would just go out to collect slaves. They would gather up all these slaves, and they would sell those slaves, the West Africans themselves, to the Portuguese, who would bring them over to the New World. Almost all slaves ended up in the Portuguese uh, colony of Brazil, but a fair amount were also sold to the Caribbean and to the Americas. Uh, so. West Africans, and that slave trade, by the way, has been going on since like a thousand CE. The Arabs have been buying slaves from the West Africans since the Caliphates had established themselves. So the Portuguese show up, they of course expand the trade because there's a bigger market for the West African kingdoms to sell to. They get a bunch of West African slaves, buy them, sail across uh, the Atlantic Ocean, of course, that's called the Middle Passage, which was a very grueling, awful journey for any slaves packed in tightly without adequate food or ventilation or sanitation or anything. And then of course they're sold to be working in mines or plantations or ranches. And that profit, I wouldn't say profit, those goods like the tobacco or wheat or silver, whatever the hell it was that they were working for, that then is taken back to Europe, sold to Europeans or Asian kingdoms or African kingdoms. And the profits from those are used to do what do you think? What do they use those profits for? So they get slaves, they make more stuff, right? They sell, sell it back to Europe, they sell it, they make a bunch more money off of it. What's a way they can make more money? If they wanted to expand their operation, they would need more labor, right? Oh, buy more slaves. So they buy more slaves, exactly. So then they buy more slaves with those profits. They bring those slaves over. They make more of those goods, whether it's rice or okra or tobacco or sugar or whatever. Those profits come back, they sell them, they make more money, and then they use that to buy more slaves. So that's called, well, it's got two names, the Atlantic system and the triangular trade. And that's again, where they're buying slaves to make more things to sell for profits, they use their profits to expand their companies by buying more slaves, it just keeps feeding itself. All right, uh, so part of the encomienda system and all the Europeans that are operating over there in North America is uh, the Atlantic system also known as triangular trade. And again, it's a system of buying slaves to make more stuff, to sell for profits, to buy more slaves, to sell, make more stuff. It just keeps going, going, going in a triangle. All right, I, I wrote that under a comienda system, but no, that's not exclusive to the Spanish. All right, one of the things the Spanish did that's for some reason in the A. Bush curriculum is they set up a caste system based on race. Uh, it's known as La Costa or Las Costas. I can't remember if there's an S on it or not. Um, and they sort of ranked your social position based on your, your, your race. So at the very, very, very top, you had whites, obviously, because they're Spanish. 
Um, and they're not even just whites, though. It's Europeans who are born in Europe. That's the top rank, I guess you could say. Those are peninsulares. Below them are Europeans born in America. And those are called criollos. So again, positions in the government or economically, they're only open to certain castes or costas. Right? So your birth sort of determines how high you can go in society, which, by the way, is not a good recipe for maintaining a system. So at the top, Europeans born in Europe. Second to the top are Europeans born in the Americas. Uh, below that are what they would call mestizos. There's, by the way, a lot of subclasses. I'm just going to do the basic ones. Uh, mestizos, which are mixes of Native American and European. Below that, they have mulattoes. I'm going to get wrong. I think it's mulattoes. Mulattoes is when it's a mix of African, Black African, and, and European. I can barely write down here. So African, European. And then at the bottom, they have, uh, besides just um, Indios themselves, which are just Native Americans, full blood, or uh, Negros, which, they are, which are called, um, which are just basically black Africans themselves, uh, which is where Negro comes from. And uh, the mix between uh, black Africans and Native Americans was called Zombos, I think. <clears throat> so those are the mixes. And again, uh, black Africans themselves were just called Negros or Negro, and then um, the uh, Native Americans called Indio or Indios. That was their caste system, and that's going to maintain itself all the way up and even a little beyond the Latin American revolutions where when Latin American countries, mostly the Criollos, rise up in the 1820s and 1830s and kick out the uh, Spanish crown from the Americas and start countries like Mexico and Argentina and Gran Colombia and all those. The Zumbos are a mix of natives and blacks. Zombos, yeah, a mix of Native Americans and blacks. Mm -hmm. Oops, I didn't write that today. <clears throat> all right, and there's, there's like different mixes based on your color and your ancestry and things like that. But those are the basic ones. So just know that that's a, a system that sort of limits or determines how high or low you are in society. So only certain jobs and political positions and things are open. Uh, depending on what you were born into. Obviously not fair at all. It's very heredit hereditary. Any questions about the Encomienda system? All right. And again, this is not exclusive to the Encomienda system. This is the general system that all Europeans are going to use to enrich themselves. Right? The purchasing of slaves, use of those slaves to make more stuff, sell for profit, that profit buys more slaves, and going, going, going. So obviously over time, you're going to have thousands, if not millions, of African slaves brought over. Uh, of course, over here, they reproduce as well. So fairly quickly, you have, you know, over a couple hundred years anyway, you have several million slaves, uh, or at least black Africans, in the Americas. All right, so the last topic I want to cover before we start period two is one that is definitely more so a period two topic, but you do start getting the beginnings of it in period one, so I want to mention it here. Uh, and that's the mercantile or mercantilist system. And you may remember this from AP Euro. This was the idea that it was basically a race to claim as much land and resources as you could because there's only a certain amount of money in the world. You guys remember what that wealth system was called? Fixed wealth, Fixed wealth system, yeah. So mercantilism. It's the idea there's a fixed amount of wealth in the world. So the whole objective is, I want to claim and take as much territory as I can and get as many resources I, as I can because there's only a certain amount, right? So here's where we get that colonial race. So not only are they using colonies to uh, make things to sell for profit in the Americas, or the mother country, which is, of course, the country that started the colonies, uh, but also they want to get as many resources as they can. So it becomes a very competitive environment of them trying to claim things or even taking things from each other. You'll see these colonies change hands several times between Europeans. Uh, again, that's colonialism. They're going to settle, um, profitize, I guess you could say, meaning like mine, start farms, start ranches, etc. Uh, bring those supplies back to the mother country where they can then, of course, sell them for profit. 
And also, they're, very, they're competing over them because they want to get as many resources as they can themselves and take those land or resources from other Europeans. <clears throat> okay, so to do that, they're going to have a lot of things like they're going to do their best to disrupt the trade of enemy states. So if I'm England and I start a colony over here, um, in, in period two anyway, my goal is to protect that colony with forts or docks or whatever. And I'm also trying to stop the colonies of the French and Spanish or Portuguese. Now, at first they can't do that. They're really just concerned with not dying. But once they establish themselves more towards the uh, 1700s, that's when they start getting really competitive with trying to take other people's colonies from them. But the seeds were planted here uh, in period one of, of AP US history. So disrupt enemy trade, which means, of course, they're going to try to take territory, colonial territory. They're going to try to privateer, which means hiring pirates, basically, to take from the Spanish ships or French ships or whoever your enemy is. And they really don't like trading with each other. They want all of the money, gold and silver, to stay in their own country. So rather than buy sugar from the British, they want to make their own French sugar and only sell uh, to other French people or perhaps other people, other states. So I guess you would say they want to become self-dependent. Meaning, we get all of our own stuff from ourselves. We're not, we're not paying other countries to do it for us because they believe if they're paying other countries for something, they're losing some of that fixed wealth. So the whole goal is to make and get things for yourself and then perhaps sell them to other countries. That's okay. Exports are great. If I'm selling lumber to Britain, I'm getting their money. That's fantastic. But if I'm French, I don't want to buy it under this system because then I'm losing money to the British. They give me lumber and I'm giving them gold and silver. They're getting more of this fixed wealth. So they did not want imports. They didn't want to buy things from other countries, but they wanted to sell them. Right? If you guys remember, <clears throat> they encouraged people to buy stuff from their own merchants by setting up tariffs, which are uh, taxes on imports. So if the British can make something cheaper, not importance, if the British can make something cheaper, uh, the French would put a tariff on it, a tax, which makes it way more expensive to buy like lumber from the British. That forces you to buy uh, lumber from other French merchants, which keeps the money in France, uh, but you can still sell things up to Britain. That is mercantilism. And the reason why we care about that is, <clears throat> This is very competitive. And what we're going to see here, and this is going to really contribute to the start of the United States, is there's going to be a lot of competition uh, between trade systems, trade networks, and territory in the colonies. And that's going to help sort of lead to this development of American identity and later uh, the United States. Do so you guys understand mercantilism? All right, sweet. <clears throat>